Hello and welcome to the back office teardown lab. Look at this guy. This is the original prototype for the Famicom amp I made and you can see it's all a little bit jank. Uh, however, it does contain elements that have made it onto the later ones. Look, you've actually got video mode and audio mode selection switches. It was trying to do more than it needed to do, basically. And that got revised over the years, um, several variations. And the last one, which has been really running since maybe COVID for a long time, is the V5. And that's the, well, it looks like um, the previous models, like I think it was a V3. I don't know if I skipped every other model, but there was red ones. There were different ones as features uh, became more and more available on them. However, this is the last of the V5 units because that's going away because I have replaced it now with the V6. <laughs> you can tell it's powerful because it has a big V6 on it, like the V6 engine. And when we get to V8, well, we'll have the Hemi edition too. So I thought it would be an interesting uh, chance, really, this is the first V6. Uh, assembled. I assembled it earlier, but I have not tested it at all other than, you know, a bench top test to make sure the regulation and power is working. So it's not been tested in an actual device. So I thought we would get the trusty Battleship Famicom. Um, and you might be aware of this one. You've seen it in previous videos, but also in the recent Discord working on the Famicom drive. Um, yeah, so I thought I'd just dismantle this and let's put the V6 in it and see if it works. It's that simple. V6. We can approach this the same way as approaching a standard Famicom. The only difference being is it should be an awful lot easier <laughs> to remove a vamp than remove the original board. Again, depending on what board you've got, if you've got, I think it's a GPM02 with the heatsink and the, the metalwork, that's a tricky one. But if it's the earlier Famicoms, that's actually a piece of cake. Now, I don't remember which one this is. All I know is it's a working one because I've got a little green sticky sticker I've stuck on them and I think overwhelmingly the ones that don't work <laughs> outweigh the ones that work significantly. Like significantly, I think it's like 1 in 10 just come from Japan working. It's just an absolute nightmare. They, whoops, if they decide they're going to give trouble, they give trouble in a big way. And the issue with them is not that they're particularly complicated because as you'll see when you've cracked the lid on one there's not that much complication on the circuitry but it's a lot is be heavy lifting is being done by their cpu and ppu which are custom chips from rico and are really terribly made um, the overwhelming consensus in the industry is that the chips are just incredibly fragile and not particularly great in their construction and apparently that really carried over to the Super Nintendo or Super Famicom um, which really when you see their PCB looks quite similar as well so there you go oh it's a V3 it's a V3 hooray so now I do have a V3 for my collection <laughs> awesome so let's get the heat soldering iron warmed up and then we'll pull this out and it'll be interesting that we'll have the whole collection here let's pop that out so if you've got the same model uh, of famicom it will be pretty much the same process you will literally just substitute this board for the actual standard modulator board that comes in it i'm just gonna get this out of here let's get out of here and i do have some really early revision boards somewhere um, so what I've done is, uh, one of the early revision boards, which is not a very good board at all, um, just purely because it's just not well laid out, is um, I've, I've used them for those initial uh, modulator tests in Famicoms that I've got from Japan. So imagine you've got them in from Japan and you're just um, testing them. You don't really need particularly good uh, mo you know, filtering on the composite. You really just want any kind of output just to see if they're dead and alive. So I just use them as dead or alive boards. And the reason I use those ones is because if it's dead, I don't bother taking them back out. I just leave them in the unit. Right, I am unsoldering the power switch here and I'm just being lazy. I'm just putting pressure on it. Just put, just trying to pull the wires out once it's heated. And there you go, they just pop straight out. That should work well on an original board. And let's see how we're gonna handle this. Now you could do solder suckery, and I do have a solder sucker handy, but I'm gonna see if I can just get away with the same sort of thing by putting pressure. The fact is, because of all of these pins, 
<laughs> are helping each other, right? That, that's not going to work. So there's two options. Either you do use a solder sucker, um, or you could cut them. I mean, there's plenty of length there. I think I'm going to go for the solder sucker approach right now, though. And I don't know why these Japanese engineering, or whatever they're called ones, don't tend to hold a massive amount. So I'm forever getting clogs. And it might just be how I'm using it. In fact, I can see already that bit of silicone at the end is already clogged up. Absolutely clogged. Maybe I just need to make a get a shorter piece of silicone. See the plug? Get rid of that. So if you've got a solder sucker, make sure you keep it clean. You'll be going through the same process. Let's just get the last few out. And if you're lucky, you might be able to just manipulate it mechanically, you know, like so. Oh, look at that. The different types of caps on those ones. I forgot about those. And I'm just giving it a little wiggle. And some of them are starting to pop out. And seeing as we've already managed to get a few, let's just tease a few out with a bit more heat. See which ones want to come. We don't really want to break it, do we? We don't want to break our board. That's kind of a... As it's a museum piece now. It'll go in the archives of the back office show wall. Okay, so we've got it out. Just going to clean these pins, these bits of wire, because the uh, the yanking them process did tend to try to separate the them out a little bit. I think that's okay. Right, so let's take a look here. So now, in the correct order, we have a point one, we have a three, we have a five, and we have a six. Wow, that's rare, isn't it? Rare to get them all together. Right, so we've got the V6 now. And you can see what I'm doing. Oh, packed, uh, do I want to put the power switch or do I want to put the main? Let's put the main one first just because it's a little bit more fiddly because you've got more wires to deal with. So, uh, of course, mine are all like damaged. Great. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give them a little trim here just because the ends are so frayed out now. But you can see here you've got plenty, and even if this got damaged, you could replace it with wires. So it's not the end of the world if you, you know, you've got a less than perfect set of cables there. And I've soldered them in different ways, by the way. I have before actually just placed them on top and soldered them like that. So, you know, even if you can't poke them through the holes, which to be honest, looking at some of them is gonna be a challenge. Um, just get them soldered to the pad however you can. Okay, off camera, I actually had to give up, embarrassingly. Um, yeah, I just messed them up. I made them worse and made them worse, made them worse. So I guess we are going to be doing the uh, other technique, which, uh, well, I think do it as your default technique if you don't get those off cleanly. And really, you can apply. Let's do it for both of these. So I'm going to put the board in at first, but before I do, I'm going to clip on this little doodad that you get in the kit that I... 3D print, and that actually covers all of the holes at the back of the case here. So I, I advise putting it on first because it's a bit of a pain to try and do afterwards. In fact, I think every time I've done it, I've broken it. And uh, oh, by the way, before you fit it in, if you don't want the multicolor LED here flashing, you can obviously swap out the LED, but there's a jumper here called enabled. And you say, hang on, it's not soldered, it's a solder jumper, but you can just about see in there a fine trace. Just cut it with your knife. So it's basically got a solder trace enabling it by default. Um, and if you don't want it, just give it a little cut with a knife. Easy, you don't need a, need a soldering iron anymore. I've not really seen too much, too many videos and such of people with the uh, LED deactivate. In fact, I've never seen a scenario with it deactivate, but I'm sure some people might. That's why I included the option to disable it. But I would like to see though if anybody's replaced it with any other cool looking uh, themed color. Because you used to get like the family clones that would be blue. And I think it would be neat to see one that's all blue with a blue LED. 
Okay, there's that screw. So you can see I'm screwing it in now without soldering anything in at all. I'm that, I'm that confident that I'm going to be able to solder it in afterwards, retrospectively. I'm putting in these four screws. And the weird thing, by the way, of the Famicom is I don't think it's a Phillips screw. It's a weird screw, something they use perhaps only in Japan. Now, you can see here I've got the power wire here. I'm just going to bend it over, you see, and just poke it in from the top. And I'm not going to poke it all the way home. In fact, I'm going to leave a little bit protruding because I do need to solder it from the top too. So I'm going to leave them in like that. Just a bit, you know, you can see there's a bit sticking out there. Let's get right in there. And that'll do nicely. You don't need to solder from the other side. There you go, that's one there. And that's this other side. That doesn't look great. I feel it could do with a bit, a bit looking a bit dry. There, and that's that one done. And then we've got these other pins. Uh, and effectively they've been tinned whilst I've been messing with them. So. I've baked, baked them with the soldering iron, and but you can see they really just line up with that. And look, that pin seven's looking a bit dicey. So yeah, yours will be better than mine, surely. And you don't really need it in the hole again. It's up to you. Uh, I can't get it in the hole because through all my messing, there's so much solder on them, they won't really want to fit anymore. So I'm just going to start by getting, oops, pin one here soldered. Oh, it's sk skidding all over the place. And you know what, I'm going to make this a little bit easier on myself by actually tinning the pads first. So if you just tin the pads, so there. In fact, do I believe I could tin all the pads and it will be easier? Yeah, let's just do one for now. <laughs> I've been caught out before, things like that. And now just touch that on there. Oop. Needed a bit holding down. Let's get the tweezers on it. There you go. So you can see now I've got that there, it's really anchored, so I can just solder them one at a time. And I think I am just going to nip in there underneath the board and add solder to all of those pads. Because I think you can just apply it the same way, you know, as if you're just soldering down. There you go. A component, a surface mount component by hand. And just applying them one at a time. And I'll zoom in a little bit, let's see, you can see. It's not not particularly pretty it's not an amazing job but there are so many people out there who do an amazing job um, on the discord I do see them frequently posted and they've done some lovely soldering jobs hey and there's some other people who've done less lovely soldering jobs but the thing works anyway as long as it works it's good enough I suppose though that's probably a good piece of advice that if something doesn't work that should be your first step as well. Check your soldering. And look, that's particularly heinous, that one there. I'm going to chop off those little uh, legs. That's that's some bad work. Don't judge me! Let's get those legs up. And give them a little trim. There we go. Nicely <laughs> installed. Uh, by some definition of nice. And then, of course, the back cover just pops back on there. You're really done at this point. Um, the nice thing to do, of course, is just check all your wires or where they should be, because you've got these rails here that's going to push down on things, so you want it to fit nicely. Let's bring that up here. And if you've got the back on properly, you can see those little bits get covered up. And find your six screws wherever they may be, and I think, oh, there was, I actually thought I lost mine for a moment, and uh, just get it together, and we'll plug it in momentarily. Sorry I sound a bit different, I've gone handheld with the old camera, and uh, it's got a certain lens where I have to be quite arm's length to be able to fit any of this in. So we've got it on the bench and you can see here you've got TV adapter and RF, so sorry, AC adapter. And there it is, all hooked up. You can see really I've just connected the video lead and the power lead. And the video lead is no more than an RCA stereo lead. So one channel contains video and the other contains sound. Depending on your TV, it might be the left or the right, it will split it into stereo for you at the TV end. And you can see the picture is looking pretty good. I'm pretty pleased with this and 
You can hear, of course, the sound is working as expected. I don't know with uh, Nintendo if they, you know, copyright claim you when you do the sound. Let's turn it off while we're here. Um, trying to get into the world. There we go. And you can see that's the typical picture on a TFT type screen. Um, reset works as normal. Power works as normal. Let's pop that in. Let's try another cartridge, whatever that one is. Ooh, there you go. Pocket Zorus, all working. Now I can't be bothered to get it, but I do have my drive in the other room, but I've only got Othello for it. So I've got just the RAM adapter with one of those flashcard things on it. Let's fire that up. Please set disc. Not sure what to try. How about a bit of the old bubble bobble? Now loading. I'll put the sound on, just a little bit quieter. How about that? Hmm. So allegedly we should be getting better sound, right? Because the old RAM pack gives you extra sound channels, I believe. I don't know if you're a fan of the old bubble bubble, but that's again what it looks like. Oh, set side B. Now loading. Come on. These discs didn't hold much, so you can see all the issues you get. So if you're a fan of bubble bubble, that's what it looks like. Let's have a yep, pretty bubbly bobbly. It's really hard to play it with one hand. Ah! So there we have it, a V6 enabled Famicom and the uh, rest of the board can go into the museum of vamps. I feel though I need to make a V6, although I, should, I, I always keep in the last of the line, so I'll have to keep the last of the V6s. However, it might be a few years yet if it is anything like the V5. If you haven't got one, please consider one. Go on backofficeshow.com and pick yourself up one. They are on the... I say that. I don't know when you're watching this. They might be available, might not. Sometimes they go out of stock and then I have to make a whole bunch. And I make them right here in the UK on my bench using my these exact snips, these exact tweezers and my own very fingers. As ever... Thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye. <laughs>